Elon Musk and his team at Neuralink presented recently a solution that is not invasive, can be used at home with an app, without a doctor, and yet it will be able to collect far more data than any other device currently on the market. A few months before Musk's presentation, DARPA held a colloquium in which several solutions were presented to solve some of the problems that Neuralink is focusing on, like a brain-related disorder, whether it is a result of an accident or congenital. DARPA on brain-to-computer interface since the 90s through dozens of programs. And over the past 18 years, it has, demo it has demonstrated advanced neurotechnologies that rely on surgical implanted electrodes to interface with the central or peripheral nervous systems. These systems take signals from the brain and find patterns which are used to drive prosthetics. Since 2006, DARPA has also been working with the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory on a program called Revolutionizing Prosthetics. The goal of the program is to advance the current state of prosthetic systems and develop new means for people to drive them. One solution was to develop a modular prosthetic limb system that has the speed, strength, range of motion, form factor and weight of the 50 percentile military men. And that includes sensors in the fingertips that can detect forces and accelerations. DARPA went beyond the original objective and combined motor control with brain sensory stimulation so that these prosthetics could be controlled using signals from the brain and patterns hidden in these signals. So this is Jan. Uh, we worked with her on the prosthetics program with the University of Pittsburgh and she volunteered to have two intracortical electrode arrays placed in her motor cortex and through months of training she was able to control the modular prosthetic limb in three directional dimensions, three uh, rotational dimensions and open and close her hand in various ways. And using these, she was able to feed herself a bar of chocolate, as you saw in the video. Which for her was a major reason for joining the study. It's a, it's a good reason. Um, and this is Nathan here on the right. And uh, he has the same kinds of arrays that Jan does. Uh, but in addition to the motor cortex, he also has arrays placed in the somatosensory cortex. And this is the area of the brain that processes a sense of touch. So he can direct the limb in the same way that Jan can. Uh, but when he reaches out and make, makes contact with objects on his fingertips, uh, he can sense those forces. Um, so when he reaches out and shakes Obama's hand, he can uh, feel that handshake. One of the amazing things about the brain is its ability to generalize. So if a brain learns how to press a button or how to turn or rotate a knob, it can apply that learned skill to a variety of different objects and in a variety of different scenarios. So we use the same neural mappings that were tied to directional rotation control, and we connected them to the surface features of an aircraft within a flight simulator. And within minutes, both Nathan and Jan were able to fly through hoops and through the Grand Canyon and over and around the, the pyramids of uh, Egypt in the flight simulator. Um, and as you can see on this video on the right, Nathan was able to uh, not only direct a plane here at the center of the screen, but he was also able to control the behavior of these aircraft here at the top of the screen at the same time. So what we see here in this uh, first paradigm is the ability to use BCI signals uh, for low-level direct control of specific functions, uh, such as controlling a prosthetic limb or controlling a plane. And for some use cases, this is going to be the best uh, approach for users to interact with objects or to interact with the world. Um, there are some limitations associated with this control uh, related to the user's attention and the amount of information that we can collect from the neural interface, the signal bandwidth. A parallel solution that DARPA is also exploring is a combination of BCI commands with AI and with computer vision in particular. In this scenario, a system can use a technology such as eye tracking to point to an object of interest and let the system use computer vision to identify the objects. Once the objects are recognized, the system figures out how to manipulate them and then generates a list of tasks that can be completed. The user then makes a selection with a go switch or with a gas pedal to initiate the system through the selected task. Here you see we have a computer vision sensor that's uh, scanning the workspace around the modular prosthetic limb and providing a video feed to the user. And on top of this video feed, we had some augmented reality overlays uh, that showed the user where it identified objects on this table, in this case, balls. And when the user looked at 
the objects and sent a go signal with their brain computer interface, the system would then initiate this, this task, which is picking up the ball, um, and complete it without them having to think about the low-level controls associated with manipulating the limb. Now, one thing you'll notice is that this user is moving their arm. This is not a paralyzed individual, but they do have a direct neural interface, an electrocorticography grid, uh, which is providing us a BCI signal associated and correlated with arm movements. Now, this is a very simple BCI signal, so this doesn't require uh, an invasive interface. In some cases, it can require a non-invasive interface. Or if the interface, uh, the control system is simple enough, it can be done with just an eye tracker or a gaze tracker, which we explored in this system here. So this is Glenn. Glenn has a robotic manipulator mounted to his wheelchair, and he's able to control that manipula manipulator using buttons and menus that are presented in his mixed reality headset. He also has a computer vision sensor over his shoulder that's scanning the workspace and identifying objects, in this case, uh, a coffee maker. And when it identifies that coffee maker, it will uh, present a context menu that he can navigate using the system and then select a particular task to be completed. So this kind of interface provides uh, a close coupling with the user. Uh, user and the interface is, is connected uh, pretty closely. Uh, provides an opportunity to provide a lot of useful visual content, including the uh, limb overlay that you see there as well, um, which could be useful for example, displaying what the task, how the task will be executed in advance of it actually being executed. So what we see here for this second paradigm is uh, a very simple interface driving an intelligent system, and we've been successful in demonstrating a number of different uh, applications and useful uh, uses of such a system. Um, but it is dependent greatly on the capabilities of the intelligence system, uh, namely the computer vision and the manipulation. We have seen that a machine can accomplish a task, but each task is made of subtasks. For example, grabbing a cup also means reaching for it, grabbing it, lifting it. These sub-actions are referred to as primitives. With machine learning, we can recombine primitives and accomplish new tasks. So here is a, a video of a robot manipulator basically reaching down and, and lifting an object. So you can play the video. And what we want to show here is that instead of just teaching the robot arm how to reach and, and lift an object, we want to really learn the primitives associated with that task. In this case, uh, if you look on the chart on the, on, the, uh, on the right, it's the reach, grasp, and lift stages. And so the way we're able to do this is to apply machine learning techniques, such as taking the velocity of, a, uh, of the entire trajectory. And the intuition is that if we can find abrupt changes in that velocity, we can find transition points where we can start thinking about where these different primitives uh, can get chunked together. And then using unsupervised learning techniques, we can actually figure out the exact decomposition. And the idea now is if we can reason about these primitives, the, our research objective now is to show that we can take neural control and we can recombine these primitives into doing something that's completely different than the initial demonstration.